Amen. Take your Bibles. Turn with me, please, to John chapter number four. <clears throat> John chapter number four. I, seeking the face of God today for the message tonight, struggled really to get settled on one specific thought. It was late in the afternoon when God gave me this thought, and that's really all I have right now is a thought. But if God gets in it, it'll be all right. If he don't, I'm going to Ocean City. Seriously, we had a, we did something a little different with the teens. For those of you that don't know, I am the current youth pastor as well as the old pastor. And just wanted to do something different with the young people today, just kind of surprise them. So we just loaded up on the bus and took them to the mall let them walk around and shop and browse, and we ate there at the food court and came back for choir practice. Um, they work so hard in school, and they serve so much around the church. A lot of you would never believe how much the young people do behind the scenes. Uh, it's just good young people. I thank God for them. But it was this afternoon late before we left that God gave me this thought, and I thought, my goodness, I hadn't had time to develop this. But I'm going to just follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I covet your prayers. And uh, let's just see where this thing ends up, all right? Father, I ask you now if you'd help me. Lord, I take serious the opportunity to preach. And Lord, it's never my intention or my desire to ever mount this pulpit and be unprepared. But Father, tonight I feel like you want me to pursue this thought and I need you to help put it all together in our hearts. All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. So minister to us tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Two places I want you to look, John 4 and John 7. John 4 and John 7. We're going to look at John 7 first, and then we're going to go over to John chapter number 4. John chapter 7, verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. In John chapter number four, we find a story where Jesus mentions this truth that he later mentioned in John 7. In John chapter number four, Jesus and his disciples are on a journey. Let's just begin reading in verse number one. When therefore Jesus knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. You might ought to underline that verse. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, Jesus saith unto her, give me 
to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. As I was thinking this afternoon about different kinds of thirst, I was thinking about the concept of thirst. My mind went to this story. And as I began to read it and as I began to meditate on it, I recognized there are several different kinds of thirst in this story. <clears throat> Let's just look at a couple of them. The Bible says that Jesus, in verse number six, being weary with his journey, sent thus on the well, and he said to the woman that came to draw water in verse number seven, give me to drink. First of all, there is that natural thirst. That's a natural thirst that every human being experiences where the body craves and calls out for fluid. The body is made up of a large percentage of our body's fluid, requires water, requires fluid. <clears throat> you can go 30, 40 days without eating, but medically speaking, about three days is as long as you can go without your body intaking any kind of a fluid. Your body needs it in order to survive. And God has made the human body so that when they get to the place to where the cells in their body and the muscles in their body and the joints in their body and all of the parts of our body that needs water to function when they get low and they need water, he created a sensation in our body that we call thirst. And when our body begins to thirst, then that's our body crying out for water, for liquid. A lot of people today don't drink water. They drink Coke and they drink uh, coffee and they drink other beverages, but at the end of the day, your body requires water in order to be healthy and in order to survive. Jesus, when he sat down on that well that day, was experiencing a natural physical thirst for literal physical water. And there are a lot of similarities, a lot of comparisons that can be drawn from the natural thirst for water to the other thirst that we're gonna see in this story. At just a glance, you would only probably recognize maybe uh, that one where he said, uh, give me to drink. And she later said to him, said, tell me about this water in verse 15 that I thirst not. I'm interested in drinking some water that I will never have to come back to this well and draw water out of this well ever again. I don't like having to come up here. I don't like having to uh, uh, drop my water pot. I don't like the physical labor and the exertion and the routine that's required each and every day for me to come up here and get water. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she's zeroed in on this physical thirst. Jesus was thirsty. In just a minute, if I can remember, because I don't have any notes, I want to come back to what makes people thirsty. But the second thirst that I see in this story is the spiritual thirst. Now, here's the thing. 
Jesus was thirsty and he knew it. She was thirsty and didn't know it. But Jesus knew it. And as he's talking about physical water and physical natural thirst and that urging and that craving of the natural man for liquid with which to uh, uh, bring into the body, Jesus then turns the whole thing around and begins to deal with another thirst. And that is a spiritual thirst. Now, Jesus said to her while she's drawing him physical water, while she's pulling the bucket out of the well, as she's drawing her water pot, he looks at her and says to her in verse number 10, I'm leaving a lot out in verse number nine. She couldn't believe he was even talking to her. She was a Samaritan. She was half Jew and half Gentile. And they were despised. They were despised by the Jews and they were despised by the Gentiles. And they kind of formed their own, their own community. The area of Samaria were made up of Samaritans and they were hated, they were despised. We talk about and hear about racism today and, and people mistreating people because of the color of their skin or where they're from. I'm telling you the Samaritan people were looked down on in the worst possible way in Bible times. She was amazed, first of all, that how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She was blown away by the fact that this Jewish man was even speaking to her, much less asking her if he could have a drink out of her water pot. She was floored. She was flabbergasted, as you could say, by, by him just asking her, but as she then begins to, I'm guessing maybe uh, as she's either talking to him or she's in the process of trying to get him some water, Jesus begins to speak to him in verse number 10 and he changes the subject from natural physical water to a spiritual water that she was not even aware of. And he said, if you knew who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus said to her, if you had any idea who it was sitting here on the edge of this well, if you had any idea that I am God manifested in the flesh, sent by God to this earth to meet the need of a spiritual thirst that you probably don't even know you have. If you had any idea that I've got a mama, but I don't have an earthly daddy. My father is God. If you had any idea that the Holy Ghost overshadowed a virgin named Mary, and that which was conceived in her was conceived of the Holy Ghost, and, and in Luke 2, I was born and laid in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. And here I am now, a full grown man, sitting here on the edge of this well. If you had any idea who I was, you'd be asking me for water. She had no idea what he was talking about. But Jesus was referring to something that is far greater and far more serious, far more important than natural thirst, and that is a spiritual thirst. A thirst for God. Now he knew she needed God and he knew she was thirsty for God, but she didn't know that she was thirsty for God. She just knew she was thirsty for something. I'm gonna tell you why there's people in Dundalk right now sitting on the floor somewhere shooting heroin in their arms. I'm gonna tell you right now why, 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 why there's people in Dundalk walking in and out of the liquor stores and the 7-Elevens and, and the gas stations in Dundalk and they're buying liquor and they're buying 24 packs of, of beer and they're buying, they're buying uh, brandy and they're buying vodka. I'm gonna tell you right now why there's people sitting on bar stools all over Baltimore. They're thirsty for something and they don't know what it is. They're trying to meet a need. There's an emptiness, there's a void in their life. 
and they're trying to plug everything under the sun into that empty void. They're plugging booze into it, and they're plugging drugs, and they're popping pills, and they're going to the psychiatrist, and they're getting prescriptions, and, and they're getting involved in illicit sexual uh, promiscuity. They're cheating on their wives, and they're and they're whoremonging, and they're whore hopping, and they're and they're and they're and they're gambling, and they're working seventy hours a week, thinking that the job or the career or the money or the pleasure is going to meet that need. But I'm telling you something: she was thirsty for something and didn't know what it was. She was thirsty for God and didn't know it. And Jesus said, "If you had any idea." Who was sitting right next to you? You'd be asking me for a drink of living water. She couldn't understand what he's talking about. Because he's talking about a physical, literal water and then begin to spiritualize it. She said in verse 11, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. And from whence then hast thou that living water? How? Sir, you don't have a bucket. You don't have a water pot. Verse 12, art thou greater than our father Jacob? Oh, if she only knew. That she was talking to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said in verse number 13, ma'am, you need to help me change subjects here. You need to help me. I just, I just jumped off of one train on one track onto another train. I jumped off this well and this water to another well and another water. Yeah. Ma'am, if you'll listen to me just a minute, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. And the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And she still couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Sir, give, give me some. I want it. Give me some of this water. He said, maybe I need to quit talking about water and just get down right down to the nitty gritty. He said, go get your husband. <sighs> What's he doing right here? I'll tell you what he's doing. Is everybody still with me? He's dropping the plow Amen. and he's addressing her sin problem. Yeah. Okay, you want some of this living water? Good. Go get your husband. Sir, I don't have a husband. He said, bingo. Because you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine right then this woman that was so happy, this Jewish man was talking to her and wasn't ashamed of her. Imagine right about now, she began to blush. I can't help but believe, but right about now, her face turned beet red. And the shame of her sinful lifestyle was made so aware to her right then, right there. Sir, I don't have a husband. No, you don't. You've had five, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now, see, in today's society, that ain't no big deal. In today's society, they wouldn't even blush over that admission right there. What's he doing? He's, he's, he's dealing with the heart of her problem. It's her sin. And he begins to deal with her about her sin. He begins to deal with her about who God is. Boy, I wish I had time to preach all this. I can tell you this right now in verse number 25. God turned the light on in that woman's heart. She said, I know Messiah's coming, which is called Christ. And when he's come, he will tell us all things. Whew. Jesus said unto her, you looking at him. Yeah. Yeah. She said, I know there's a Messiah coming. His name is Christ. And when he comes, he's going to make all this make sense. He said, I'm him. 
I can't help but believe that right about then she took a long drink of that living water. Look at what happens in verse number 27. Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. They couldn't believe Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. Is everybody okay? Why talk? Why? Yet no man say, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. She's not thinking about natural water anymore. She finally got off of that train on that track and got on this train on this track. And she left her water pot. The water pot that she brought down there to get some natural water to, to, to meet a natural need. She left that water pot and she went running back into the city. And the Bible says, look at what she said. And she went away to the city and saith to the men, Kind of wonder which men it was. She said to the, to the men, I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb here just a little bit. And I'm going to assume she found some of them men she'd been married to. And she said, you got to... Mm. I've always, she says, I've always had a, had a problem with men. Mm -hmm. I've always had an eye for men. I've always had a lustful, sinful heart when it came to men. And everywhere I went, I was looking for a man. And I always seemed to find one too. But I need you boys to listen to me very carefully. I need you to come see a man. Yeah. Amen, amen. I need you to come. She says, I've met a lot of men in my day. I've talked to a lot of men in my day. I've slept with a lot of men. I've been married to a lot of men. But I ain't never seen a man like this. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. There's the natural thirst. There's the spiritual thirst. There's the thirst for God that every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet right. is born with. Yes. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved and you're, you know something's missing, yes, sir. you just ain't been able to put your finger on it. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what it is tonight. It's God. That's what you're thirsty for. That's what you're longing for. But then I see a third thirst in here. There's a natural thirst. This ain't alliterated. If you're taking notes, this is ugly. There's that natural thirst, and then there's that thirst for God. But then thirdly, I see in this story, I see a thirst to do something for God. Now watch this, watch this. He said in verse number four, he must needs go through Samaria. Do you see that? There was a longing, there was something down deep inside of him pulling him towards Samaria. There was something inside of him craving and desiring and longing to go to Samaria. What was it? Well, when the disciples got back from Walmart, in verse number 31, the disciples prayed unto him, saying, Here, Master, eat. Jesus said in verse 32, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Y'all been, been out shopping for food to feed a natural hunger and a natural desire but if you remember when I said when we go, we're going to have to go through Samaria, it was because there was a desire and a thirst and a hunger in my soul to do something for God. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's right. I got meat to eat that you know not of. There's a thirst to do something for God. Yes, there's a thirst 
inside of a born again, blood bought child of God that's right with God, you're gonna have to need to do some things for him. I mean, you ain't gonna be able to get out of it. You're not gonna be able to get away from it. Something inside of you is gonna be pulling and drawing for you to go outside of your comfort zone. Hey, they was going way outside their comfort zone going through Samaria. It was going way out of their comfort zone. They weren't welcome there. But there was a desire and a thirst and a hunger and a longing in the heart of Jesus Christ to do something for God. Well, I see another thirst in there. The Bible says in verse number 21, Jesus said unto her, well, verse 20, she said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvations of the Lord. For the hour cometh and now we is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I see a fourth thirst in this story. And I see a thirst for the presence and the power of God and intimate communion with God. She said, he said to her, said, you don't have a clue. You have no idea what it is to worship. You do not know what worship is. She said, he said this. He said, but we know, verse 22, what we worship. In verse 23, he says, the hour cometh, and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, there will be a hunger and a thirst. There'll be a desire. There'll be a longing down inside of the heart and the soul of a born again, blood bought child of God to experience communion and worship and intimacy and fellowship at the feet of God. If you're here this, this evening, you say, Preacher, I've never experienced that thirst to worship God. You might all double check whether or not you've ever been saved. David said this in Psalm 42, verse number one, as the heart, H-A-R-T, that's a little deer, mountain deer. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? He said, just like that deer that's being chased by the hunters, being chased by the dogs through the forest and over the meadows, and that deer's tongue's hanging out, and he's so thirsty, every part of that deer is smelling for water and thinking about water and longing for water and searching for water. As the heart longeth for the water, even so does my soul long and thirst after God. You've never experienced that kind of thirst for God. You have no idea what you're missing out on. Amen. Amen. When he quenches yes. that thirst. I'm telling you, there's a thirst for God that only God can meet in a lost person and there's a thirst for God that only God can meet in the heart and soul of a saved person. Yes. I thought about this. Let me give you this and I'm done. What makes somebody thirsty? You say, well, I don't ever get thirsty for God. I don't have a thirst to do anything for God. I don't have a thirst to worship God. I don't have a desire to be in his presence. I got to think about why people get thirsty. Well, hard work will make you thirsty. I'm going to tell you why some people ain't thirsty for God. They're not doing anything. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, you work very long, you're going to get thirsty. Yes, sir. Stay with me now. And the hotter it is, and the worse the climate is, the, yes. the, the, the quicker you get thirsty, and the thirstier you get. Amen. That's right. I've done construction in my day. I've been framing houses before out in the middle of a field somewhere. And I have to say, boys, y'all got to just give me a minute. I got to go to the truck. We'd have a big old igloo cooler full of ice water and a bag of styrofoam cups. I have to drink me some water. 
They left us on a job one time in Eatonton, Georgia, down in a little subdivision called Reynolds Plantation. And we was up there building a the deck. Boss dropped us off. They didn't have any water run to the property yet. And we was out, I'm talking, we was all the way down at the bottom end of this long winding road, all the way out on this, on the edge of the bay there, on the edge of the on the edge of uh, of the lake. And I was standing up there working on that deck, and I was so thirsty, all I could think about was getting something to drink. There wasn't anywhere to drink. This was back before everybody had cell phones. I'm standing up there building that deck, and I looked out, and I said, there's a whole lake full of water right here, and I'm about to choke. And I did what some of y'all would never do. I crawled down off of that deck. I walked over there to the edge of that lake, laid down on my stomach, stuck my face in that lake, and I drunk that water out of that lake. It was brown, little floaters in there, little minnows looking at me. Like, don't you look at me like that. You drink it too. I stuck my face in that old nasty lake and I drunk that water because I was thirsty. I was working. I was, I was, I was busy and I got thirsty. I won't tell you. You won't be able to go there. breakfast. Anybody had any of that country ham? Country ham. You know what I'm talking about. You know it's country ham. The first bite you take because it's, it's got a lot of salt in it. I'll tell you what you do. You eat a piece of that and see how long it is for you ain't looking for a water fountain somewhere. There's something about salt. You know what makes me thirsty for God? Go Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Ye are the salt of the earth. Yeah. You spend time around the right kind of people. You hang around the salt. You feel it. Feel a little something on that right there. You hang around salty people. You hang around the people that are the salt of the earth. Right. Now, there's two different kinds of salt. There's the salt salt, and then there's that salt which has lost its savor. Yeah, and Jesus said this about salt that's lost its savor. Are you ready for those of y'all think Pastor Chip is real mean sometimes? Here's what Jesus said about people that had lost their, their savor. He said it's henceforth good for nothing. He said it's good for nothing. You want to talk about good for nothing Christians, that's the salt that's lost its savor. He said it's henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trotted under the foot of men. And if you're hanging around people that's lost their savor, you probably won't get that thirsty. Go ahead. Go but ahead. you hang around some salt. Yeah, go ahead. You hang yeah. around some salty believers. Yeah. You hang around some Christians that are sowing the seed and yeah. witnessing and sharing the gospel and testifying and and enjoying their salvation, I promise you, you'll get so thirsty, you can't hardly stand it. Somebody asked me one time, I said, Preacher, why you say so fired up? How do you stay so fired up all the time? I said, because I hang around fired up. You get around the salt, friend, you can't get enough. You'll drink and drink and drink and drink and still want some more. I'm trying to wrap this up. I'm going to, I'm going to Salisbury tonight. Whew. Work makes you thirsty. Salt makes you thirsty. Hey, food, eating food, make you thirsty. We'll tell you why some people don't ever get thirsty. Because they're not eating. Yeah. They're not eating. Amen. I tell you what you do. You go to a restaurant, you go to all you can eat buffet and you eat three or four or five plates of food without something to drink, I guarantee you right now, you'll be miserable. I know how you are. Where's my refill? Where's my refill? 
Y'all wouldn't make it. They give you a can, Coke, with your make. go to the restaurant and you eat, you go home and eat, see how thirsty to do anything for God and while they're not thirsty to be in the presence of God. They're not spending much time in that Bible. Because even when you're half backslid, you start reading that Bible right there. If you're saved, something on the inside starts happening. Those slumbering cords, he'll start to stir them. I'm out of time. I mean, there's at least four thirst in that chapter. There wasn't but two when we was on the bus, but God gave me two more. There's a natural thirst. There's a spiritual thirst. There's a thirst to do something for God, and there's a thirst to spend time in the presence of God, worshiping. Are you thirsty tonight? If you're, if you're lost and you're thirsty, you're in a good place. Amen. If you're saved and you're thirsty, you're in a good place tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Musicians are coming. Folks are coming to the altar. I just wonder tonight, is there anybody here? Is there anybody here tonight? It says, Preacher, I'm not sure I've ever been saved. I'm not sure if I died right now that I would go to heaven. And I would really appreciate it if you would remember me in prayer. Would you be honest enough with God right now? Right now, while these are down here praying, would you be honest enough?